do want to say again, uh, uh, I hope you're all blessed with a, a happy new year. Uh, we have an old year that's uh, now behind us, and we have a whole new year that's in front of us. And I, I tell you, I had to, I do a good bit of thinking about what I wanted to preach to you on this first day of the new year. And the more I thought about it, the more my mind uh, kept coming to the idea of the church, and specifically what the church is supposed to be. In this modern age uh, of the 2020s, the church, the church has kind of lost its way. The church uh, of this age has become uh, divided. The church of this age, and I'm talking about the global church, the, the larger church, but that church has become divisive. In fact, I'll go so far as to say uh, that I really believe that the church has divided into two completely different faiths. The church has divided, and now we have two theologies uh, that, are, uh, uh, that are proclaiming two different gods and that are promoting two different uh, saviors. Both of those groups of people that claim to be Christians, both of those groups claim to be the true church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but one of them is true and one of them is false. And I think that's something we really need to understand uh, as we approach this new year. You see, there's, there's really only one true God, and there's only one uh, true Savior, and therefore there's only one true church. And I want you to understand something. That church will never fail. That church cannot fail. Nothing, and I mean nothing, can defeat the true church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 18, He said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Pray with me just a moment, Lord, we do thank you for this church. We thank you for the, the true church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, there are many pastors and many good churches this morning who are lifting you up in true praise and true glory. They're, tre they're preaching, teaching the true gospel. And Lord, we thank you for that church. We know that there are many churches that have gone astray, that are teaching a false gospel. Lord, we pray that they'll be corrected. Uh, Lord, that you will uh, uh, turn those people, uh, Lord, that those within those congregations, that they won't uh, be deceived by false teachers. But Lord, we know that there's a division in the church today. And well, Lord, we pray... Uh, that we always remain on the right side of that division. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We need to really understand what Jesus is saying here. This is a promise that Jesus Christ has made to His true church. He says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But I want you to understand there is a, uh, uh, there's a condition there. There's a condition to that promise <laughs> Jesus said just before that. He said, I will build my church. I will build my church. The church that prevails is the church that Jesus Christ builds in His way. Sadly, we live in an age of many man-made churches that are built man's way. But that's not what Jesus intended for His church. He intended that the church would be built His way by Him. Now when that happens, when that happens, Jesus promises there is nothing that can change the church. There's nothing that can tie that church down, nothing that can imprison it, not even the gates of hell can stand uh, against it. Now the question is, how does Jesus build his church? If indeed the church that prevails is the church that is built by Jesus his way, how is it that Jesus builds his church? Now that's what we're going to look into this morning. We're going to look into the uh, how G every, every good building, and I've built some buildings in my life, but every, every good building begins with a building plan. We're going to look into the Word of God, and we're going to see how it is that Jesus builds His church. What is the Master's plan? I think the best place for us to go to, uh, to understand this is to go to the original church. To go back to the very first church, uh, the church that was born in the city of Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, uh, this church was born on the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they appeared uh, to them, then appeared to them uh, divided tongues uh, as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. 
And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. And the Spirit gave them utterance. As the Spirit gave them utterance. That was the birth of the church. 120 some odd souls gathered in the upper room for a prayer service when the Holy Spirit came down upon them. And the church in Jerusalem uh, was born. Uh, also, I want you to understand Peter, the apostle, was the first man ever to preach a sermon in the church. Right after that, we hear in verse 14, but Peter standing up, uh, 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 up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. So Peter, being full of the Holy Spirit, he stands before the whole of what was then the first original church, and he preaches a sermon, and that sermon, it had great effect on the people of Judea, great effect on the people of Jerusalem. Scripture tells us that very day that the Lord added some 3,000 people to that church. 3,000, can you imagine 3,000 people joining the church in a single day? Those people, they had no idea how to build a church. No idea. They didn't even have the first word of the New Testament writings recorded for them yet. Yet somehow the church was built. How did that happen? It was built by Jesus Christ in Jesus' way. Before we go any further with that, I want us to understand the basics of the Lord's plan for building His church. It all begins just as any building begins with the foundation, the footings, we might say, that are under that church. Well, what are those? I think it can be summed up in three words. Three words. Study, fellowship, and prayer. I think we hear that in verse 42. Look at how this new church in Jerusalem proceeded. In verse 42, they, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship in breaking of bread, and in prayers. When that we hear study, we hear fellowship, and we hear prayer. Those are the foundational elements to the church. That's the footing that the church is built upon. First, this church in Jerusalem was made up of true believers. We need to understand that all of them had come to true saving faith in Jesus Christ. And every one of them, they heard the word. They heard the word of God from the apostles and they obeyed that word. Verse 41 says that they gladly received his word and were baptized. So they were committed to learning the Word of God. They were committed to hearing the Word of God. They were committed to understanding the Word of God. And they were committed to obeying the Word which they heard. The apostles. The apostles were teaching the church in Jerusalem. And the members of the church in Jerusalem were, were listening. And they were studying. And they were learning. That's the priority for the church. That's the foundation. That's the very rock for which the church is built on. It's built on understanding. It's built on, it's built on wisdom. It's built on the knowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. It's built upon doctrine. So the first priority for the church is found in teaching and learning. That's our priority. To come into the church with a heart open to learning the Word of God and hearing the Word of God and then obeying the Word of God. And we need to understand that in order to, uh, to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, a person has to be saved. They have to have true salvation. You can't, you can't understand. The Holy Spirit will not empower you to understand and apply the Word of God to your life unless you are indeed a truly saved Christian. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 8, he says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. The gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it just sounds like foolishness to people who aren't being saved. But to those who are uh, saved, those who are in the process uh, of being saved, of being sanctified, it is the power of God. Again, I'll say the other church, they didn't have the Scriptures. They didn't have the New Testament writings in their hands yet. It hadn't been written yet. 
But what they were hearing is apostolic doctrine. They were hearing the very word of God from the mouths of the apostles themselves. That uh, uh, word that the apostles spoke to them in, in Jerusalem in those days uh, is the same very word that would be later recorded in the scriptures that we hold in our hands. So understand the word that they heard in Jerusalem concerning the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ was the very same word that we hear in the Bible today. So there was no difference in the message that they received. They heard the word in Jerusalem. They were committed to the word in Jerusalem. They were committed to the apostles' doctrine. They were committed to obedience to that word. Obedience to the word that we hear and that we learn is foundational to the gospel, to the, to the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is, it is part of that footing. But understand, we cannot obey what we do not understand. Therefore, we need teachers. We need preachers that are gifted. We need people who are speaking the word of God into our lives. That's why Paul told Timothy. Timothy was a young preacher that had been following uh, uh, Paul around to his missionary journeys. And then Paul sent Timothy to the church at Ephesus uh, uh, to make sure that that church was on the right track. And Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, he said, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and patience. Paul said, look, you've got to convince those people by the word of God. You've got to rebuke them. In other words, correct them when they're out of line by the word of God. You've got to exhort them. You're going to lift them up by the word of God. He says, you're going to teach them the word of God and you're going to do that with patience. With long suffering. It's going to take a while, but they're going to learn. They have to learn. Preachers that don't preach the Word of God and teach the Word of God, exhort and rebuke and convince and all of these things that, uh, regarding the Word. Pre the preachers that don't do that, teachers that don't do that, they're useless. They're worthless. They have no purpose. And there's a false church out there where there are many who are doing just that. They're false teachers. They're pathetic teachers. I didn't say prophetic. They are pathetic teachers. Paul knew that day was coming. He said there's a day coming when the world will be full of false teachers and false churches and false Christians who will be drawn to that teaching. He told that same young man, Timothy. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, he said, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned to, 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 to fables. Paul said that day is coming. That day is coming. And friends, I believe with all of my heart that that day is here. We are living in those days when those false churches exist and those false teachers exist and there are many who are being drawn into them. But we're not interested in that. We truly want to know what the true church looks like. And I really believe that what we see here in these scriptures is that the true church is built on study and fellowship and prayer. The true church is based, uh, is built upon study, study of the Word of God, understanding the doctrine that we believe, and then obeying that doctrine, but also understand the foundation that the church is also found in, in fellowship. Fellowship. Uh, Acts 2, verse 42, the same verse again, says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, so they were studying and they were learning, and fellowship in breaking of bread. That's the second part of the foundation. And some people get kind of confused over that. Fellowship and the breaking of bread. Understand, the focus of their fellowship was in the breaking of bread. Now, when you hear those words, it gets kind of confusing, especially with us as Baptists, because we love our fellowship meals. But the scripture there, when it speaks of breaking of bread, it's not talking about what we think of as a fellowship meal. This isn't about gathering in what we call the fellowship hall and protecting of, a, of all of those wonderful dishes that some of you ladies and men prepare for us. But when the Scripture speaks of the breaking of bread in these instances, it's really talking about the Lord's Supper. 
Lord's Supper. They found their fellowship in gathering together and partaking together of the Lord's Supper. That was the focus of their fellowship. And, you know, we, we, love to, uh, we love to talk about the cross. We, we love uh, uh, the symbols and, and, and things, that the fish, you know, that I see on people's cars, all of that. Uh, those are symbols of our Christian faith. But the greatest symbol that we have of our faith in Jesus Christ is found in the Lord's Supper. It symbolizes Jesus' death on the cross. It symbolizes Jesus' blood and His broken body and the sacrifice that He made for us. The sacrifice is an atonement for our sins. Uh, and we find fellowship in that. We find fellowship in our common salvation that came by the blood of the Lamb, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And this, this ceremony, if you will, use that word, it, it helps us remember that. So they were gathered together and they were, uh, they were having fellowship, but their fellowship was found in the memory that they, were, that they were, had a common salvation. They were unified by their salvation and they were reminded of that salvation by the breaking of bread. So the foundation of the church is first of all in study, secondly in fellowship, but not only that, Again, verse 42, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Prayers. The true church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is built upon prayer. Prayer. That may be one area where we as a church can work. I think every church can work in that area. The false church doesn't do that. I've been in some churches some small, some large, but I've been in churches where, where the prayer wasn't where it ought to be. I remember one large church that we went to, uh, the service went on and there was a lot of music, it looked like a light show, it was a, a large church and there was a, it was almost like a concert kind of an atmosphere, people were singing and clapping their hands and they were being entertained. Church was full. It was full of people that came for the concert and, but then when the when the service was over and the prayer began, as we were bowing our heads to pray, I saw people out of the corners of my eyes. They were leaving. They were headed for the door. They wanted to get out of the parking lot and get in their car to avoid the traffic jam. That church was missing uh, the true prayer of the true church. Yet this church in Jerusalem understood. James tells us in James 5, verse 16, he says, Confess your trespasses to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. To the church in Jerusalem, they remembered prayer. They remembered what the Lord Jesus had promised. Jesus said in John 14, verse 14, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So the foundation of the church, we find that it is set in concrete, if you will, upon study and fellowship and prayer. That's how Jesus builds His church. He builds His church on that foundation. But I want us to look for just a minute at the results of a church that is built upon uh, study and, and fellowship and prayer. After you build the foundation, the next thing that comes in a building is the framework. The framing goes on. And I think we see that also as a, a model in this church at Jerusalem. In verses 43 through 47, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and all had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, uh, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I think we see the framework of the church in those verses, and I think that framework is seen in wonder, love, and joy. Those three, wonder, love, and joy. What happens when a, uh, when a church is built upon a, a footing of, uh, of study and fellowship and, uh, and prayer? Uh, they will experience wonder and love and joy. 
Verse 43 again, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Scripture says these people that were in that first church in Jerusalem, they feared God. They feared God. And I want you to understand, that's not terror. That's not horror, uh, like I'm, I'm just scared of God. What it really means, the word there that's translated is awe, respect, honor for God, wonder at His divine power. Understand what was happening there in that church. God had granted these apostles uh, miraculous powers. They were doing some healings and they were, uh, they were laying hands on people. Blind people were seeing and, and all of that was happening at the hands of the apostles. And God had allowed them uh, to work those miracles, those sign gifts, uh, so that people would understand that they were actually sent by the Lord Jesus Christ and they were actually speaking the Word of God. Now in the church today, we don't need to see those kinds of wonders anymore. We don't need to see those kinds of wonders because we already have the Word of God. We have it in Scripture. It's already fulfilled. The Scripture's already written to us. So we don't need to see men working wonders anymore to know what the Word of God is. We already have the completed Word of God in our Bibles. But understand this. God is still working miracles in the true church today. In the true church, souls are being saved. Souls, I mean, there is no greater miracle than that to think that a lost soul can be saved from hell. Friends, that is a miracle. In the true church of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's transformation going on. People's lives are being changed. Broken homes are being mended. Uh, shattered marriages are being restored. There's physical healing and there's uh, spiritual healing. There's emotional healing. All of that going on. All of that miraculous work that the Lord is doing inside the house of God whenever a church is built upon the foundation that we've spoken of. It's framed in wonder. Those miracles occur and we wonder at the divine power of God that we see at work in the church. That's what's happening in the true church of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the early church was also full of love. Not only wonder, there was love. In verses 44 and 45, Now all who believed were together, and all had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. In other words, they were loving each other by making sure that needs were met. That needs were met. And I want you to understand, because there's often a lot of confusion over this as well, these people didn't sell everything they had and put it in one lump and live in a commune. That wasn't what was going on there. It took me a while to understand this, and I think it helped when I learned some of the Greek words, but when I read this in Greek, what I understood was this was a, a, an ongoing thing. These people that still had houses, we just heard a while ago they were going from house to house breaking bread, right? So they still had houses. They still had possessions. What was going on was whenever they looked out over their congregation and they saw someone that had a need, if they had something that they could get rid of, they sold it in order to meet that person's needs. So they were loving each other by meeting the needs of the needy within the church. That was how they were loving each other, making sure everybody was taken care of. And we need to understand that the church, the church has a biblical responsibility to take care of the needy outside the church. But our priority, our priority is to make sure that the church is taking care of the needs of those who are in the church first. Those who are part of the body of Christ, that is our priority. That's sacrificial love. When you see somebody in the church that needs something and you're willing to give up your own resources and give up your own in order to take care of them, that is love. So we want to make sure that we're taking care of those who are in the church. Now understand that a, a church that's built on the, the right footing and framed us in wonder and love will also experience great joy because that church is blessed by God. First, the church is blessed with gladness. And secondly, the church is blessed with a heart, a, a simple heart. 
The word says in verse 46, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple. They were in great unity there, breaking bread from house to house. They, uh, they had house churches, and they were moving from house to house, and they were uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper in those houses. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. The church that's built on the right foundation and framed in a right way will experience joy because of the blessings that God has given. And I tell you, peace of mind and simplicity of heart, that's, that's a great blessing from God. And only the true church of Jesus Christ that is built by Jesus' plan and His way can experience those blessings, the gladness and the joy that comes from the Lord Himself, the blessings that come. Not only are those blessings experienced by those who are in the church, but when, when people outside the church see how the Lord is blessing that church or with, with gladness and joy and, and peace and all of these wonderful blessings, uh, the, uh, the church outside, the, the people outside the church, they experience the fear of God too. They began to, to experience the wonder of seeing God working inside the church and the blessings that the church has received. When you see God working inside your, toy, your church, you, you really don't have any choice but to experience joy. When you see God working in your church, it's going to rise up inside of you. Because of that, in verse 47, these people in the church in Jerusalem, they were praising God. <coughs> And they found favor with all people. They were praising God in their church because of the blessings that they had received. They were thankful. They were thankful. And, and people outside the church were seeing uh, the church and, and how it was built and what was going on there and how they were taking care of each other and how they were praising God and how they were learning and they were growing uh, spiritually. They had fellowship together. They were loving each other. All of these things were going on in the church. The people outside the church, they looked in the church and they found favor with the church. Because of that, God blessed them in yet another way. In verse 47, God added to the church daily those who were being saved. Because this church in Jerusalem was built Jesus' way by Jesus himself, the church in Jerusalem was blessed to, to be growing daily. And here I'm talking about numerical growth. Numerical growth. Sometimes we, we often are guilty a little bit of saying, well, we have spiritual growth in our church, but we need some numerical growth too. We need numbers coming into the church. And the church is built on the right foundation and framed in the right way will we'll receive the blessings of God and He will add to that church. There's an old farmer saying that I like to use every now and again and I, I think it's true, but farmers sometimes say whatever isn't growing is dying. Whatever it is isn't growing is dying. I think that's true of crops. I think that's true of livestock. But I understand it's also true of churches. We don't like to hear it, but it's true. Now I want you to understand the larger church, the global sphere of Jesus Christ, true church in the world, that church will never die. But individual churches can, and they do. Beverly and I, we, we drive in past several churches uh, as we come to uh, Midland on Sunday morning. And I can tell you there's two churches we drive by every week that were thriving churches when I was a kid. Good churches, full of people, large crowds. Both of those churches are dead as a doornail today. Dead. One of them has been changed into a residence. People are living in it. The other one has a, a zoning proposal sign out in front of it today that uh, I think they're getting ready to turn it into some kind of business. I don't know if it's going to be an antique store or what it's going to be. Wedding venue, who knows? A pretty church. Nice building. Nobody in it. We pass another church uh, that's taking its last breath. It's getting ready to die. It was growth. Beverly and I attended the service there several years ago in that church. When we went in that day, I think there were three or four people who were meeting in that church. And I'm not kidding when I tell you the hymnals, uh, the, the song books were moldy. <laughs> the backs of the pews were moldy. That church was dying. It's still dying. Churches can and they do die. Jesus warned, warned churches about that in the book of Revelation. 
In the book of Revelation, Jesus wrote seven letters to seven specific churches. And I think what we can hear Jesus telling these churches is stick to the plan. Stick to the plan. The church must be built Jesus' way. The church must be built Jesus' way by Christ himself. And if it's not, Jesus tells these churches, if you don't do it my way, I'm going to come in, I'm going to take you out. Listen to what he said to the church in Ephesus. In Revelation 2, verse 5, he said, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your last stand from its place unless you repent. He wrote to the church of Pergamos. He said in verse 16 of chapter 2, Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword in my mouth. And then to the church of Sardis, he says, Remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. That happens to churches that don't follow the plan. And they died. That wasn't happening in Jerusalem. Not at this particular point in history. There's still church in Jerusalem today. That church hasn't died. But the church in Jerusalem was built upon the Lord's plan. The Lord built it His way. And that church was strong. That church was founded in study. It was founded in fellowship. Founded in prayer. It was framed in wonder and love and joy. Now I'm convinced that we have a great church here. I'm convinced that God has a good plan for us. But that's what we need to do. We need to stick to the Lord's plan. Stick to the Lord's plan. We don't need to be grasping at straws. I hear all of these little churches, they're, they're going into a panic. They're saying, we've got to start this program or, or do this thing or, or do that thing. We're going to do church singing and we're going to draw all these people in. We're going to have cookouts and we're going to have all these events. And yeah, they get people into the church, but that's not the true church. It's not built God's way. It's built man's way. We must stick to the plan. That's my prayer for Midland Baptist Church for the year 2023, that we will stick to the plan of God. It all begins with good study. That means we need good teaching in our Sunday school classes. We need, uh, we need especially good preaching from the pulpit. We need to understand the Word of God and, and obey the Word of God and, and, and as, uh, continue steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine. When we do that, uh, then the church automatically, automatically is going to have good fellowship. And we're going to begin a good prayer, uh, prayer life together, which we, we do well here. We're going to experience, we're going to experience the, uh, the framework of wonder over the work that the Lord is doing in our church. And, and we're, going to, we're going to experience love for each other. And we're going to know the joy of the blessings that the Lord pours out upon us as we follow His plan. That's our, that's our goal. As a church, is to stick to the plan and that Jesus build this church His way. <clears throat> Takes time. Takes time. Took Noah, what, 110 years to build the ark? Building's not, a, not fast. My, my friend, Brother Mike, built a new house up in uh, uh, East Tennessee, and it's taking him forever. He's doing a lot of that work himself, but he's out there every day with his hammer, and he, he, we gave him a hammer when he left. It, had a, it was a gold-plated hammer because we knew the work he was going to do, and written on that hammer is keep on hammering. <laughs> We've got to keep on hammering. We keep working the way Jesus tells us to work. That's how we build our church. We stick to the plan. And I'm going to end there this morning with the, that part of the service. Let's, let's do a song together. Let's stand and sing uh, number 557. It's been a while since I played this, so hang with me here.
the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, He's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord.